Good afternoon. This is Rod McMillian speaking. I'm very sorry for our brief delay. I now call to order the meeting of the Audit Committee for Tuesday, May 25th, 2021. Baltimore County Public Schools and offices are closed to the public until further notice in order to maintain the health and safety of our staff and our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13, 2020 board meeting and the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely. Subject to the establishment of a mechanism that will allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to, re to also remotely attend these portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Opens Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's audit committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through live stream on BCPS website. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding their motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on agenda item. Ms. Jamison, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I will start with Ms. Joes. Yes. Ms. Pasteur. Yes. Ms. Rowe. Yes. Mr. McMillian. Yes. Thank you. Ms. Jamison, please call the roll of staff members participating in today's meeting. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I will start with Ms. Barr. Yes. Ms. Stevens. Yes. Mr. Fletcher. Yes. Ms. Manna. Yes. Dr. Scriven. Present. Mr. Saris. Present. Ms. Burnop. Present. Mr. Strait. Present. Ms. Crew. Present. Mr. Edwards. Present. Mr. Spore. Present. Mr. Dixit. Present. Mr. Plate. Present. Are there any other attendees present that I did not recognize? Hearing no additional names, I turn the meeting back to you, Mr. McMillian. Ms. Jamison, thank you very much. Our next item is opening remarks. I'm extremely happy that we didn't have to cancel the May meeting and that we were fortunate enough to get everybody available to reschedule to the day. So thank everybody for working on their schedules and making this, this day available. Our next item is reports. Our first item is the contingency and change order process. And for that, I call on Mr. Dixit. So good afternoon here, Mr. McMillian. Uh, members of the audit committee, uh, other members of the Office of Audit and other team members. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, as requested, we have prepared a presentation on contingency and change order so that there's a better understanding of what our process is and what are the checks and balances that are built within the process. Uh, at the end of presentation, I will answer any questions you may have. And if I can't answer questions, I will get back to you through superintendent's office. Next slide, please. So a construction contingency, this is where the thing start. Board approves a contract, which is a bid amount, which is a bid, which, which has been bid in most of the cases. And within that construction contract, there is a certain amount, 10% of contingency, uh, that is to cover any unanticipated cost for changes in scope or due to delays or that can arise during the construction process. Next slide, please. So change order is an amendment to the original construction contract, and this is an important feature to understand that uh, the change order is only used uh, when there is an extra work that is not included in the contract and which alters the uh, contract amount. 
uh, completion date or the scope of work. Change order process is, is the process that is used to handle those kind of uh, situations. Next slide, please. So the original construction contract is based on a defined schedule and scope of work that includes known or expected project site and weather conditions. A change order is a process which is which is compensating for unknown or unanticipated conditions that requires modification to the scope of work and in some cases schedule. Next slide, please. So this slide gives you why do we need change orders? What are some of the reasons? It could be weather conditions. It could be poor soil conditions, unknown hazardous material. It could be because of an error or omission in the construction document or because we requested additional work for the changes that were that came after the contract document were prepared or code changes that may have been uh, implemented by the authority having jurisdiction. So there may be code changes by county, by um, um, building uh, agencies or whatever. So those code, code, code changes are after the construction documents are completed. Next slide, please. Change orders uh, are continuously monitored uh, as the contingency limit is approached and evaluation is performed to determine if there's additional contingency that is needed. Uh, during the design and construction process, experienced professional staff and consultants continuously evaluate and minimize the potential for future change orders. And later on in the presentation, We'll go over the types of professional and their experience, qualification and background so that the most most part controllable cost is during the design uh, of the contract document. Next slide, please. So how is change order initiated? It could be because contractor, he said the scope of work is not included in the construction contract. It could be the construction manager who's at the site. It could be the design team that feels that some of the uh, some of the design standards uh, are different than what they anticipated, or it could be that the owner added the work for the needs that have changed. Next slide, please. So these are some of the questions uh, that are considered when reviewing a change order. Is the specified work contained in the construction document? Is the change order necessary? Does the change order resolve the issue? Is all supporting documentation provided and accurate? Are the costs reasonable and consistent with in the industry standard? I just want to add that uh, being an ex project manager myself, the mindset and focus of the project manager is that there's compliance with technical document, there's quality of the end product, is the schedule, are we going to meet the schedule? Is it going to be within the cost that we had anticipated and budgeted? And what are the legal, ethical, and professional implications of a decision, you know, if the change order is needed, or is it approved or not approved? So that's the mindset that really directs most of the decision making process. Next slide, please. So who reviews, approves and change order? There is a myth, there's a notion out there that there is some one person who's just approving the amount based on their dealings with the contractor. And that is not true. There are several parties involved uh, that look and approve uh, change orders. Board approved architectural and engineering team. Uh, this is an engineering team that originally designed the project. There is a board approved construction manager in larger projects that is looking there at all of the construction pro projects. There is a BCPS project manager or facilities inspector, depending on the size of the project. And there are qualified senior supervisor review 
that deny or approve depending on the amount of the change order request. Next slide, please. So all the reviews are uh, that are less than $50,000 and this $50,000 amount that we are talking about is within the board approved contingency. Because if if we are beyond board approved contingency, then we go back to board and get the contingency increase. But if the change order is within the board approved contingency and is is less than $50,000. Uh, manager of construction looks at it. The director of facilities construction improvement uh, looks at it, reviews it. Uh, executive director of facilities management uh, that looks at it. And if it is more than $50,000. That is reviewed by superintendent's designee. That is uh, chief administration administrative and operations officer. Next slide, please. So who are the professionals? What are their qualifications that are looking at the change or? And this is where in my mind the most important auditing or cost control function is. It is extremely important in a construction process that the design team members are qualified that are looking at it. These are professional licensed or architects and, and engineers. Our department consists of licensed civil, electrical, mechanical engineers and licensed architects. So depending on the project, they are looking at it to ensure uh, that this meets all the you know, professional standards if we have to approve a change order. Construction managers and construction professionals with more than 15 years of field experience. These people are experienced, qualified. Uh, they have construction culture embedded in that and they are the most qualified people to look at these change orders before they are approved. Um, then the next level is the BCPS project managers and construction specialists with more than five years of experience. Senior supervisor is a degreed engineer with over 35 years of design and construction experience. Next slide please. Uh, construction manager, they are generally degreed construction professionals with over 30 years of construction experience. Uh, FCI, which is construction and improvement director, is a professional engineer with over 37 years of design and construction experience. And the executive director is a degreed engineer with over 50 years of design, construction and maintenance experience. These are the folks that are looking at that or core depending on the size of that change order and depending on the uh, the, the, the quality the, the size of the project uh, and what I want to emphasize that any audit conducted later on cannot catch the mindset and the need for the change order at that time that it was approved. So it's extremely important for all of us here to understand that you can look at the same change order 18 months after the project is done and you may find uh, you, you can never understand the mindset and the need of that change or at that time when it was approved. Uh, next slide please. So why doesn't the board approve every change order? So we wanted to give you a little bit of idea as to how many change orders we are talking about. Change order is part of construction culture. A small size project which is less than 15 million may have anywhere from 0 to 25 change order. A large renovation project may have uh, 100 to 200 change orders. A largest new school project more than 30 million may have 75 to 125 change orders. So you can just imagine with dozens of projects going on all the time. If every change order has to be approved by the board, board will be swamped with the number of change orders that have to be approved and it will have definite impact on the cost and schedule of the project itself. Next slide please. With over 200 active projects, the number of board exhibits per meeting could exceed 100. A minimum of six weeks would be added to the processing time for individual change order. 
cost for individual projects would be increased due to additional delays in processing change order. Projects would ultimately be delayed and not likely to open on time. This is extremely important for all of us to understand. A, an elementary school project which takes 14 to 15 months and just imagine several hundred change orders to be approved by the board. Every change order will delay, is likely to delay the construction uh, schedule and there are multiple contractors in a contract in a project. And there'll be a domino effect on the delay claims by the succeeding contractors that will be working on the project. Uh, so we just wanted to share this so that everybody has a good understanding of the process and the rationale behind what we do and why we do. Next slide, please. This is just pictorial representation of what the domino effect will be. So the picture that you see is a typical uh, Gantt chart, if I may, for the schedule, and it shows different contractors that are coming after one after the other. And if the first one is late, it will have implication on all the succeeding projects and contractually we are bound to pay for delay claims if the delay has nothing to do with the work of the contractor. So uh, we needed to share that so that you understand what's the reasoning behind it. Uh, next slide, please. So why 10 percent? You know, a lot of board members in the past, are, well, why don't you have 2 percent? Why don't you have 15 percent? So the honest answer is that we don't know at the start of the project whether we are going to need 2 percent or 5 percent or 15 percent. Uh, so we take that 10 percent number and use it judiciously with the process, using the process that I just shared with you. And if there's a little bit of money left, that money goes back into the bank account and is needed and reverts back uh, to the folks that have given us money and we make a joint decision about which other uh, projects need funding where this money can be used. So it doesn't go to any specified other 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 project other than what is the board approved project uh, projects are. Next slide please. So this this gives you the balance that I just shared state and county funded project. They're different, you know, they're state funds and they're county funds. So county funds are used for another board approved project. State funds are reverted for other previously state and board approved projects. And county funds are used for another board approved project. So there is no favorite project from anybody that is added, which, which uses these funds. They are still within the bounds of project that board has already approved. Next slide, please. So we have been uh, audited. Uh, this is important point that we wanted to share. A uh, lot of folks have come in the, in the last 15 years. Uh, two of the Maryland State Office of Legislative Auditors, they have come looked at it. Uh, Andrea's team has looked at it at least once. And public school construction program, which is the state part of the construction. They review all change orders on all state funded projects. And what the result has been no findings or a fault and all projects completed on time. So this is for any construction team and I do want to commend here our construction and improvement team for the diligence. Uh, for for the process they use and for continuously monitoring that uh, that for a record of 15 years and being audited by so many different folks and not a finding or fault. Not too many organizations can claim that. So next slide please. So that was a quick overview. Hopefully it is educational. Uh, if there are any questions, I'll definitely try to answer those questions. So back to you, Mr. McMillian. Thank you, Mr. Pete. Now I have a couple of questions, but any board members have questions before my questions? Any other committee members? Can people hear me? I just want to make sure they can hear me. I can hear you. 
Okay. So, Mr. Pete, here's my questions. On page nine and 10 of your presentation, you listed a number of different people involved in the change order process. Are all those people, do they all evaluate the change order? Is it individuals within that, those two pages? Or so, do, how does, how does that, are they a committee? How does that actually work? So every project has an engineer that designed it. Every project has a project manager. These project managers are reporting to a senior project manager or a construction manager. Depending on the size of change order, uh, we have a process where if it is more than certain amount, then the next level is uh, reviewing it. But all change orders are not reviewed by all members of the construction team. We have dozens and dozens of projects going on and each project is assigned a project person. So it is now one person that is handling all the projects. Did I answer your question? Yes, but I think you raised another question. So the project manager, it goes back to the project manager. Does he have a circle of people around him that help him evaluate the change orders? If, if he needs help, uh, they, for example, we have licensed mechanical, electrical and civil engineers. And if the if, if the question relates to one of those branches, yes, he consults with them before he makes the decision. OK, now my second question, you mentioned if uh, if a uh, auditing group goes back 18 months later and evaluates, tries to evaluate the change order, they're not going to they're not going to come up with the mindset. Can you expand on that a little bit? So when the project manager makes a decision at that time, at the time of construction, that this change may impact the quality of the product. This change may impact time schedule, the schedule of project, that this change may impact, uh, may create a domino effect. If I'm the auditor that's coming 18 months after the fact, uh, I'll have difficult time reading that mindset at that time. So the best auditing we can do is reinforce the qualification and background and experience of that person who's making that decision and provide the support that person needs to make that decision. And we have done that. And that's what you see in the results of uh, several audits that have been done. OK, thank you very much for answering my questions. Ms. Rose said she didn't have any questions. Ms. Joes or Ms. Pastor, questions? Ms. Mr. McMillian, just a quick um, yes, comment to Mr. Yes, please. <laughs> thank you. Um, that was a good presentation, Mr. Dixit. Um, thank you for it. Uh, you know, I do also want to point out that because of the pandemic, um, a lot of our material goods have gone up exponentially, the pricing. And we've heard about it. And so you might experience the next few years as we're going through construction change orders because materials have sh skyrocketed and some of them, the contractors may come back. So um, again, thank you for the presentation. Thank you and thank you for the compliments. And Mr. Pete, I just want to say this, that anybody, any other board members that have questions to me about the change order process, I'm going to refer them to this document and your your presentation. So I Absolutely. thank you very much. Absolutely, and we'll be glad to answer those questions. And I do want to take this time to uh, appreciate uh, and acknowledge the health uh, help provided by Ms. Barr's team, because whenever we have any question about the audit, our team members, they consult her, they invite her to audit that, and we have monthly meeting with our law office. So if there are any questions that are under their purview that may have legal impact, we are keeping them informed. So it is not work in isolation. It is a combined team effort, and I do want to acknowledge that. Mr. Pete, thank you. Thank you. Now, I know I don't need a motion to accept Mr. Pete's report. Uh, but I, I'm pretty sure I need a roll call vote. Ms. Jamison, will you call the vote, please? Ms. Joes? Point of clarification, Mr. McMillan, are we just voting on the presentation? What is the vote for? Yeah, yes, I'm a, I was a little confused. I know we didn't need a motion to accept his report. 
but I'm interpreting that I need a vote anyway, but I might be wrong on that. Yes, I guess. Oh, Mr. Mr. Excuse me, Mr. Mailey, and this is Ms. Barr. I don't believe that you need to um, vote vote on accepting Mr. Dis Di Mr. Dixit's presentation. Thank okay, you. Okay, outstanding. Thank you for clarifying that. Okay, we're going to go on to, let me see if I can find the next piece. Okay, our second item is investigative unit statistics, and for that I call on Mr. Fletcher. Thank you, Mr. McMillian, and I'm going to wait just one second uh, for Mr. Corners to pop up the graphs for us. Thank you, Mr. Corners. Um, so as you can see, um, for the investigative unit for the month of April, uh, we did receive three new cases. Um, they came in through our hotline. We had a payroll fraud, uh, an employee behavior, and then an actual um, information seeking or, or no allegation uh, re reported came in through our hotline. Um, those three, as you can see in our second chart, brings us up to 61 uh, cases for the fiscal year. Uh, again, it's uh, 10 of the 12 months at this point. And you can see the breakdown here in chart two, uh, the different categories um, that, that those 61 cases comprise. Um, and tell you, as of today, we are up to 67. Uh, so we, we uh, have taken in more during the month of May. And if we scroll down to that third chart, we can take a look at our year over year uh, analysis. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep, there we go. Um, our year over year analysis and fiscal year 21 is the purple line. Um, and uh, I know you've heard me say repeatedly now, uh, certainly trending lower than the previous two years, um, but um, uh, the hotline is certainly being used uh, at this point. So as we go into our second page, uh, again, we're still talking about the new cases that, that came in uh, during the month and then during the fiscal year. Now we're going to take a look at how they're categorized in terms of fraud, waste, or abuse. So for the three cases that came in during the month of April, uh, one was categorized as fraud, uh, and then the other two are considered non-fraud, waste, or abuse. Uh, and then in the second chart here, you can see for the 61 cases for the entire fiscal year, here's our breakdown of, of those cases. Again, um, uh, of 20 um, coming through as fraud, and then four waste, 10 abuse, and 27 um, are considered non-fraud, waste, or abuse. Then as we take a look at that third chart here on page two, again, we're going to do a year-over-year -year analysis as we scroll down just a tad, Mr. Corners, I'm sorry. <clears throat> we'll take a, a look at that year-over-year -year analysis. Again, uh, fiscal year 21 is our, our purple column. Um, and, and you can see that there is uh, certainly a, a slight change in what we have considered as fraud and what we have considered as abuse. Um, the other category is waste and non-fraud waste and abuse, relatively consistent over the last three fiscal years. Um, but again, that, that's just the difference in the type of cases that are coming in uh, through our hotline. And so as we go to our last page, um, page three, now we want to talk about the cases that we have closed. Uh, so during the month of April, we did close eight cases. Um, this first chart, we're going to talk about the substantiation uh, of those eight cases. So we were able to substantiate one of um, um, the allegations. Five were unsubstantiated. One was actually considered inconclusive, and then one was a management issue uh, or, or was not investigated. Um, and then that second chart actually lets us know at this point, 10 months through the fiscal year, uh, we have closed 63 cases. And then this is the breakdown um, for those 63. So we have eight substantiated, one partially substantiated, 18 unsubstantiated, uh, 11 inconclusive, and then 25 that are considered management issues or, or were not investigated. Uh, and then again, that last chart on page three is where we're going to do our year over year analysis. Uh, and again, fiscal year 21 is going to be the purple column. Uh, and so uh, what we see here is that we do see the uh, drop in substantiated. Um, and it appears to be that that is kind of countered by that little uptick in unsubstantiated. Um, the rest of uh, the three columns seem to re remain relatively consistent uh, year over year, uh, a few percentage points here and there. 
but again, our, our main um, changes there between the substantiated and unsubstantiated. And Mr. McMillian, that is uh, our presentation for our, our April investigative unit. Mr. Fletcher, thank you very much. Committee members, questions? There appears to be no questions. Mr. Fletcher, thank you very much. Thank you. I will now entertain a motion to convene an administrative function section session. It has been properly moved. Okay. Will somebody please make that motion? Administrative so function. Bro. I will now entertain a motion to convene an administrative function session. So moved. So moved, bro. Uh. Second, bro. Okay, so Miss. Ms. Joes did it first and Ms. Rose second. It's been properly moved and seconded that we convene an administrative function session to discuss committee operations. Ms. Jameson, will you please call the roll? Ms. Joes? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Ms. Pasteur? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Three in favor. Okay, great. So now we.